Rachel Rickard Strauss, editor of MoneyWise, and I'm here with Jim Rickard, who is a financial expert, an investment advisor, and New York Times best-selling author, uh, most recently of four books, um, The Four Absolutely Promised, No Connection to the Four Forces of the Apocalypse. Um, and we're going to talk about the fourth, which is just out, its aftermath, um, Seven Secrets of Wealth Preservation in the Coming Chaos. So I think first we need to talk about this coming chaos, what it is and why it's coming. Well, uh, the, this, there will be a financial crisis actually worse than the one in 2008. And you say things like that, people say, well, you're, you're exaggerating or you know, fear mongering. No, there's, there's good analysis behind it. But I go all the way back to 1987, October 19th, 1987, the US stock market crashed 22% in one day. That would be 5,000 points on the uh, Dow Jones index. Not 500, but 5,000 in one day. Uh, 1994, the Mexican tequila crisis. 1997, the Asian financial crisis. 98, Russia, long-term capital management. Dot-com collapse. NASDAQ goes down 80%. 2007, mortgages. 2008, the global financial crisis. So the point, Rachel, is that these things happen every five, six, seven years with some regularity. Now It's now been 11 years since the last one. It doesn't mean we have a collapse tomorrow, but no one should be surprised if we do. So then the point I make, well, if it's coming, which it is, and if you can see it and kind of estimate the magnitude, and that's important because this will actually be worse than 2008. So what's that about? Because absolutely, we kind of do one now, right? right. I mean, we, we, we things work in cycles. Mm -hmm. um, we arguably haven't recovered yet from the last one, but even so, it's about time. And we've spoken before about... Um, you refer to it as you don't know what the snowflake is that's going to cause the avalanche, right. but there's going to be a snowflake. But why is this one going to cause a bigger avalanche than, than ones previous? Well, you can actually look at the sequence, and I'll just go back to 1998, not to spend a lot of time on it, but, but what happened at the end of the day? Wall Street banded together and bailed out a hedge fund, long-term capital, and I negotiated that bailout, so I had a nice front row seat on that one. 2008, 10 years later, the central banks banded together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's going to bail out the central banks the next time? The point I make is that each crisis is bigger than the one before, and the bailout is done at a higher level than the one before. But we're now at the point where, you know, in 98, Wall Street lifted the balance sheet of a hedge fund. 2008, the central banks lifted the balance sheet of Wall Street. Who's going to lift the balance sheet of the central banks? Who's bigger than the central banks? And, and that's really the point. And that's where the title comes from when we say aftermath. People say, well, aftermath of what? And I make the point, we're still in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. I know we've had 10 years of growth and stocks are at an all-time high, I get that. But the, the, the damage was so severe and the remedy was so extreme, they've never been able to normalize, get, get their the central banks, get their balance sheets and interest rates back to normal. We're just not ready for the next one. So you need a buffer, really. I mean, what, what any central bank seems to do um, when, when things start to go a little bit, um, a bit wrong is just start printing money or lower interest rates to keep us spending. Right. And at the moment in the US as well, but in the UK here, rates are so low, where are you going to cut? Well, that's exactly the point. Now, again, I like to uh, do things on an empirical basis or scientific basis as much as possible. Uh, the evidence shows that you need to cut interest rates 4 to 5 percent to get the US out of a recession, kind of get stimulate growth, in other words. How do you cut interest rates even 4 percent if you're only at 2 percent? The answer is you can't. So then you go to QE4, quantitative easing, more money printing, and you get to zero. Let's do more money printing. But again, the Fed, Federal Reserve took its balance sheet from $800 billion to $4.5 trillion in the last crisis. They got it back down a little bit, around $3.9 trillion, but nowhere near even $2 trillion for that matter. So they're out of headroom in terms of quantitative easing. Rates aren't high enough to cut very much. So they don't have the dry powder, if you will, to get us out of another recession. And that's, that's just a normal business cycle recession. That's not even talking about a financial panic, which is, which is a different thing. So the damage done in 2008 has not been normalized. We're not ready for the next one. And if it happened, we don't have the capacity to get out of it. That's why it will be one, one reason among many why it will be a lot worse. So we should talk about some of the things that we can do. And in a sense, a lot of them, I guess, um, uh, are, are about sort of financial prudence being prepared regardless of, I mean, maybe it never happens, but you right. probably wouldn't, um, wouldn't regret being prepared anyway. Correct. And one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, okay, Jim, I've I read your books, I've heard your presentations, I follow you, I think this financial crisis is coming. 
you know, when is it coming? And I said, well, what are you waiting for? In other words, when it actually happens, you're not going to, it'll be too late to do anything about it. You know, so stocks drop 30, 40%, uh, gold's going up $100 an ounce per day, dealers won't return your phone calls, it's too late to sell your socks. The time to prepare is not when you're in the storm, it's beforehand. Uh, and uh, now is uh, you know, not too late. Uh, so um, one, of the, one of the points I make is if you absolutely knew that inflation was coming, that's the danger, it would be very easy to construct your portfolio. You'd have some gold, you'd have some real estate, you know, some hard assets, et cetera. If you knew it was going to be deflation, same thing. You could buy 10-year treasury notes, buy gilts, uh, buy things that perform well in deflation, and then connect it with, um, uh, I, I call this the barbell approach. You have your inflation hedge over here, your deflation hedge over here, and then a allocation of cash connecting the two sides of the barbell. The point I make is that um, we're on the knife edge between deflation and inflation. The world wants to deflate. The natural state of the world is deflationary because of demographics, you know, declining populations in a lot of uh, countries, uh, debt. Um, and uh, basically, the, the you know, technology is another driver. So debt, demographics, uh, uh, are, uh, and technology are driving deflation. On the other hand, you have central bank intervention. Central banks cannot tolerate deflation because it increases the real value of debt, causes bankruptcies which fall upon the banks. So they have to try to create inflation. So right now we have this unstable equilibrium that's going to tip one way or the other, and you need to be prepared for both, actually. Okay, how do you do that? Well, ha I mean, having that sort of diversification is, that you talk about of, correct, of, of yeah. having the, the cash in the middle. Right, the, the barbell. So your inflation hedges are, again, gold, hard assets, real estate. Your deflation hedges, 10-year treasury notes, gilts, um, as interest rates come down, and, and they are going to co come down further. I actually met with uh, some of the top central bankers in a closed-door meeting, relatively small group. where We were up at uh, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire at the end of July. Uh, it was the exact 75th anniversary of the original Bretton Woods Conference. Uh, Larry Summers, our Secretary of the Treasury, and others were there. Uh, and uh, it was off the record, so I can't mention the names or exactly what was said. But uh, one a senior from the uh, Regional Federal Reserve Bank, one uh, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, and one Governor of the ECB, European Central Bank. So these were the real deal central bankers. And I was surprised at how... Uh, they said rates have to come down a lot. Uh, and they were very matter-of-fact about it. And they also grasped the distinction that a lot of people miss, the difference between real rates and nominal rates. So when people say interest rates are low, nominal rates are low, but real rates are not low. And the difference, of course, is inflation. So if you take the nominal rate minus inflation, that's your real rate. So, what, so they did get the distinction. What they said is we have to get negative real rates, meaning you have to get the, the nominal rate below the rate of inflation. The problem is that we have disinflation. Inflation is dropping, so it's like a cat chasing its tail. You're, you're cutting rates, but you can't cut them fast enough to keep up with the, the decline in inflation. So th this is a race to zero. And they were, they said, yeah, we're probably heading for zero, and not, not overnight, but in about a year. Um, and then when you get there, when you get to zero, what do you do next? Well, you can go to QE, quantitative easing, more money printing. Uh, but the other thing you can do are negative interest rates. Now. The, the evidence is that negative rates don't work. They've been tried in Europe, uh, Sweden, Japan, Switzerland, and other places. The premise is that they're supposed to encourage spending, but this seems counterintuitive to any real person who, if they slowly see their savings eroded, don't necessarily go out and on a massive splurge. Well, what do economists know about real people? That's, this is the problem. You're exactly right. The theory was, uh, you know, if you have $100,000, you have 100,000 pounds in the bank, and uh, we have negative 1% interest rates. You go away for a year, you come back, it's only 99. We took 1% of your savings. Uh, and since that's happening, uh, you, it, it makes you want to spend more, borrow more. Like, why wait until they take my savings? I'm just going to go out and spend it. But people actually do the opposite. Uh, they have lifetime goals. Why are they saving at all? Uh, their retirement, their health care, uh, children's tuition, uh, buy a house, their, their parents' health care, et cetera. And if you start taking money away, they actually save more. They still, they still have to meet the goal, so they save more, they defer purchases. So instead of lending and spending and inflation, what you actually get is hoarding, savings, deferred purchases, and deflation. makes the problem worse. It, the central bankers would be the last to figure this out, but that, that's what actually happens. Um, but 
they do think it works, and the Fed, of course, the European Central Bank is already in the negative rates, but the Fed officials were quite relaxed about negative rates. Now, to be clear, they didn't say, we've made that decision, we're definitely going to do it. But the fact that they were talking about it, and they said, yeah, that's on the table, surprised me a little bit. So don't be too shocked if the U.S. gets there and let's say a year. So we get our barbells ready. Right. What's stage two? Well, stage two is um, you have to think, uh, again, that, that as I mentioned, the, the title Aftermath has two meanings. One is we're still in the aftermath of 2008. But going forward in this new financial crisis, and again, not too soon to prepare for it now, what will the aftermath of that be like? And there I suggest that, uh, you know, when, when you're in my position, uh, you know, you're a writer or speaker or whatever, people always want to put words in your mouth and they say, you know, Jim Rickard says this, it's the end of the world, sell everything, buy gold. I've never said any of those things. It's not the end of the world. Um, you shouldn't, you should have some gold. I recommend 10%, but don't go all in on any asset class. Diversification is very, very powerful. But th this could actually be a world where uh, systems break down. It's not the end of civilization, but maybe slightly more agrarian. Maybe it looks more like 1910 than, than 2020, uh, where uh, we actually go back to a, a simpler um, lifestyle, not because everybody would vote for that or want that, but, but uh, complex dynamic systems, when they break down, when infrastructure breaks down, if that sort of thing starts to happen, uh, you end up, uh, you might, you might uh, a farm might be a much more valuable asset than a, um, you know, the latest uh, cell phone. So when you say systems, are we talking about sort of banks, banking systems, tech? Corporations, all of the above. They're all, they're all deeply the interconnected. Government, government, perhaps. Well, look, uh, we all know what's going on in Venezuela, but I have a good reason to believe that South Africa may be the new Venezuela. That, that may be uh, not just the normal violence. That that country is starting to break down. Look at what's going on in Hong Kong. We know what's going on in the Middle East. I mean, these things are are a little too frequent for comfort. And don't think uh, I'm sure you know that Beijing's quite concerned about Hong Kong not only because of Hong Kong and their claim of some kind of autonomy, but uh, if they have any success, that will s start to break out in China itself. Wuhan, Jian, uh, Chongqing will start to see those kinds of things, and the communists know it. Uh, so they need to keep a lid on that. But these are all symptoms of societal breakdown. They're not specifically financial. They have financial implications. But yeah, you could see multiple complex dynamic systems, uh, power grid, financial systems, um, uh, communication systems, et cetera, sort of sequentially break down. And then, uh, you know, we could be back to a much simpler lifestyle. That is a long journey to get to, <laughs> to get to the, to the simple life. I mean, the simple life on farms, I'm kind of with you on that. Fair right. enough. Sounds good. Love a farm. Right. But what we, as a, um, as a species almost, ha would have to go through to end up at that end point, the end point doesn't sound quite as utopian as, as in my head it currently is. Well, uh, fair enough. I don't suggest any of this is utopian. My, my point is this is how societies evolve and collapse. It was this notion, uh, I think the left and progressives, but you know, maybe a lot of conservatives as well, that things just get better and better and better. You know, new technology, new medicine, better cures, um, you know, society does get wealthier, et cetera, and that's how it goes. That is not how it goes. That is not what history says. Mm -hmm. History says it's much more cyclical. Um, you know, you have rise and fall of civilizations, multiple civilizations over thousands of years. Uh, and the two biggest collapses, there might have been a more ancient one, we don't have any information, but uh, the, the Bronze Age collapse and the fall of the Roman Empire. These were at a 1,500-year tempo. It's been about 1,500 years since the fall of the Roman Empire. So if there is a 1,500-year multiple civilization collapse cycle, we could be in the middle of that. As we have sort of roughly 10-year economic cycles, so we have multi-civilizational cycles also possibly. Correct. One of the biggest failures in risk management and financial services, and I've been counting this firsthand, um, is uh, um, people do regressions. You know, you, so you look at time series of prices, et cetera, and, and do regressions and correlations and try to figure out what tells you something about something else, et cetera. And the first question I ask the, the analysts who do this is, uh, uh, how far back do you take your time series? And they go, oh, we go back 15 years, 20 years, and all the day. I said, it's about 100 years. Have you looked at you know, railroad bonds to, to government bonds in the 1890s and seen what those credit spreads did uh, from time to time? And then there, there's also research um, 
uh, one scholar did a, an 1100 year time series of prices, went back to uh, the, the, uh, the 10th century, uh, and found some goods that uh, existed through the entire time period, firewood. You know, we buy firewood today, I have a fireplace, and they bought it in the 10th century. And what he showed is that periods of inflation can last 100 years or longer, but periods of deflation can also last 100 years or longer. These are not just 10-year cycles, and we look at 10-year business cycles. But so, so the point being, there are, there are bigger forces at play, longer time spans at play. Uh, you can get two or three of them you know, all happening at the same time. Uh, again, this is good science and good history. You don't have to go that far to say, uh, well, maybe we'll just have a good old-fashioned financial crisis. Honestly, uh, Rachel, we may be in one right now as we speak. Um, someone asked me, when's the next crisis coming? I said, well, we may be in one. The, the repo problems in the U.S. financial system where the Fed, so, uh, okay, so from 2008 to 2014, we had quantitative easing. Then there was a, a, a kind of an, a, a sideways period. Then beginning in 2017, the Fed initi what initiated what they call quantitative tightening, actually reducing the money supply. I still run into people, they bang and say, well, I hate QE, you're printing money. I said, no, that's been over for about five years. They're now uh, burning money, throwing money into the furnace uh, to reduce the money supply. Except just a few days ago, they slammed on the brakes on that and flipped to quantitative easing. The Fed is in the process, as we speak, of printing $1 trillion. They, they call it system repo, but it's QE4 in, in, in all but name. Uh, why are they printing a trillion dollars when they were trying to reduce the balance sheet? They were trying to tighten the money supply and they're printing a trillion dollars? Somebody's broke, and I'm not going to mention names, I'm not going to speculate, but um, they're giving the money to the banks, taking treasuries as collateral, but they expect the banks to lend the money to non-bank players, hedge funds, private equity funds, smaller banks, the Chinese banks, etc., and take treasury securities as collateral. The way it works is I give you $100 uh, million dollars and you give me $102 million dollars of uh, treasury notes or gilts. Um, and so I've got 2% collateral. So if you don't pay me back, I sell the notes in the market and pay myself back. What does this say when the banks are hoarding the money and they won't take, they won't lend it out and take treasuries as collateral? What it says is that they're anticipating a liquidity crisis that's so bad that they will not be able to sell treasuries at anywhere near the value they got. That's a pretty scary thought. That, that means they're seeing something the rest of us are not seeing. Now, I won't go further than that because there, there's, no, there's no evidence, but, um, but just what we know about reserves being drawn down, now suddenly increased, the bank's not on lending, et cetera. Someone's in distress. Uh, it could be contained. It could go away. But if it hits and spreads, we could be back in a global liquidity crisis, uh, and it could be starting now. Okay. So that in mind, it all feels so enormous that it, 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 it's almost um, petty to, to talk about what we can do and what we should be investing in, um, but that's what people will wonder, I imagine. Right. Um, so uh, some of your other seven secrets, one I found particularly interesting was um, around uh, behavioral economics mm -hmm. um, and being wary of the nudges that, that are there um, many people believe to sort of steer us positively towards um, the right decision making. Well, you're referring to uh, this is uh, chapter three in the book, and uh, it is uh, about behavioral psychology. You know, just to be clear, behavioral psychology and the experiments that have been carried on since the 70s, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, uh, Dan Ariely, and others, um, is good science. I don't dispute the science at all. They're, 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 they're repeatable, the results are solid. They've been shown time and time again. And what they reveal are cognitive biases. We all have psychological biases, all of us. We can't get rid of them. The most we can do is understand them and try to pr protect against them. Uh, risk aversion is one, there, there are many others. But what some of the behavioral psychologists who happen to be economists or lawyers have done, and I single out uh, Cass Sunstein and uh, Richard Thaler for this Nobel Prize winner, they wrote a book called Nudge. And they've, they've helped to create a branch of the science called choice architecture. And what it says, I in effect, is, hey, I'm a PhD. I'm smarter than all your other people out there. I know what's good for you. And you can actually design forms, insurance forms, uh, retirement forms, uh, contracts, et cetera, in such a way as to get a predictable result that the person's unaware of. So the classic example, you, in the United States, we have something called the 401k. It's a 
tax deferred savings plan that you can sign up for. We, we have the I'm same sure there's the, the same thing with auto enrollment here, oh. whereby it's it's a new system that you have to opt out of saving towards a workplace pension. Right. You're automatically, if you earn ten thousand pounds or over, you are opted into it, and you have to pay three percent. Your employer pays five percent. Well, that, that's but that's an example of, of exactly what I'm describing, which is uh, and it's a classic case. So it used to be, you know, you fill out your forms. And they say, we have uh, one of these savings plans. Uh, here's the brochure. Would you like to join? And you had to opt in. You had to say, yes, I would. Uh, the uh, opt-in rate, the uh, election rate, was about 20%. But if you flip the question and say, hey, we have this plan. Here's the brochure. You're in it. Would you like to opt out? Now the participation goes up to about 80%. So just by changing the form of the question, you increase participation from 20% to 80%. So unbeknownst to the participants, they're being herded into these things. By the way, it turns out the reason that's true, people don't like to check boxes. It's just the, the, the psychological bias against checking boxes and filling out forms makes it, uh, I don't want to check any box, so if you tell me I'm in, I'm in, fine. Well, who says that's the right choice? Um, the, uh, the PhDs, you know, fail in sensing what, oh, these plans are definitely good for you. But I give an example in the book of, um, I have a uh, uh, Susie and Joe, and, and, and women are smarter, so Susie makes the right choice, but the point being, uh, she elects not to join the plan, pays her taxes, and puts all of her money into gold, and Joe joins the plan, has the benefit of tax deferral, and puts all of his money into stocks. Now, you don't have to do all of one or the other. You can, be, uh, you can have a diversified portfolio, but I track it uh, over the entirety of the 21st century to date, so from 2000 to, uh, finish the book in 2018. And it turns out that uh, based on the performance of the assets, uh, taking the withdrawals, paying your taxes, that Susie outperforms Joe, that the person who paid her taxes and bought gold did better than the person who got tax deferral and bought stocks. Um, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't join the plans or you shouldn't have stocks, but it, it goes to show that it's not automatically the case that you're better off joining these plans. So when these choice architects are steering our decision in effect making our decisions for us, assuming they're smarter than we are, assuming they know what's best for society. Uh, I challenge all those assumptions and try to encourage people to be aware of these types of hidden uh, um, uh, biases that are put into the forms themselves and make smarter choices. So it's not necessarily that they're intrinsically bad, it's just you have to be wary of them in the same way that you are wary of your own biases, you also have to be wary of how you're being steered, steered. And, and your biases yeah. are being steered as well. Right. I mean, well. here, uh, as I say, auto-enrollment, 5% um, um, sal of your salary from your employer will go towards a pension if you right. don't opt out. That's free money. It seems like quite a good deal. Yeah. Um, but I guess you're saying that there'll be some circumstances in which you just you want to make sure that you are still making the decision, Correct. and it's still the right decision for you. Well, well, two things. Number one, what is th when you opt in, or, or the, I guess you're auto enrolled, as you say, um, uh, Rachel. What does that portfolio look like? You find you often find you have very limited choices. You're not able to buy land or gold or other hard assets. You're you're put into a passive index fund or a stock fund or whatever. You could well be way over, over allocated to stocks. Who says stocks are always the right answer? So that that's one problem. Uh, but maybe you do if you, if you do half and put the other half, uh, pay your taxes and get another portfolio. But you said um, these are not automatically bad choices, but they are sort of preordained or manipulated in some way. So sometimes there are bad choices. And I spoke to Dan Ariely, who is, uh, I would say, after Daniel Kahneman, the, the, the most celebrated behavioral psychologist in the world, a master of this. And I, I spoke to him privately. And uh, I said, Dan, I said, you know this is powerful. I know this is powerful. You can dictate outcomes by kind of manipulating people's psychology. What if you were hired by a um, up-and-coming fascist dictator said, I'd like to use your choice architecture in my messaging to encourage people to support my party, which has, uh, as I say, fascist goals, uh, And because um, it could work that way. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I have, a, I have a way of dealing with that. I have a filter for that. I said, what is it? He said, well, I wouldn't work for money for anyone if I wouldn't do it for free. In other words, money is not going to get me to work for a bad actor. If I don't like you and I wouldn't do it for free, then, then uh, I won't do it for money. And I applaud the fact that A, he thought about it, and B, he had some kind of answer. But it's not a complete answer because, first of all, there are those who will. They will take the money and work for 
potentially evil people with very powerful tools. tools. And then um, finally, who's to say that his judgment, Dan's a nice guy, but who's to say his judgment of who's good or evil is always right? Then who else is he going to trust on that? I suppose ultimately you, that's the, the best that any of us have is who do I, uh, what do I think is just, who do I think is fair? And I'm, I'm not too worried because I think uh, eventually we'll all become wise to it and it won't work on us anymore anyway. Right. And the number of times I'm told, uh, people like you have done X, why don't you do that too? Right. And I think, <laughs> you, right. you rotter, I'm going to actively not do that because I can right. tell you a minute. And, and there are only s uh, so many of these tools, I think, that can be used. And once we all know them, we're alert to them. I wonder if their um, power will slip. Well, it's a good point. That's why I wrote that chapter in the book, because to me the answer is education. Once you explain what biases are, explain how you're being manipulated, uh, it doesn't mean it won't carry on, but it does mean that you can make smarter choices. And well, one example I use a lot of people like is, uh, you know, cars, at least my car, I have an Audi, but I think it's pretty across the board, you know. You open the door with the lights on, or you get out of the car with the key in your pocket, and the engine's running. They, these things beep, 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 too. They're supposed to nudge you, as uh, Thale and Sunstein would say, to do the right thing, but there's so many of them, you forget why it's beeping. It's like, well, what am I doing wrong now? What, what violation am I committing? And you do become numb to it, and you start to ignore it. Uh, and they also say, well, this, this is good stuff because it's very low cost. Not if you're getting dinged a thousand times a day. The cumulative cost can actually be quite high. I think we're, we're short on time. Can I ask you really quickly for a whistle stop on passive investing and why um, that features as for in your uh, seven secrets? And then um, right. we can leave it there. Well, I like uh, it's hard writing on economics because you, uh, I, I never dumb things down. I write it at a high level, but I do it in, in plain English. I use metaphors and history and just personal stories to make it accessible. But uh, for passive investing, uh, a good metaphor is. Uh, so a mosquito lands on the back of an elephant, what happens? The mosquito gets a good meal and the elephant doesn't notice. But if a million mosquitoes descend on the elephant, the elephant dies. So my point is, every, not every good idea remains good depending on how widely it's adopted. So in the 1970s, Jack Vogel, Vanguard Fund came along and said, look, you can't beat the market. So just put your money into an index fund. You'll have those stock market performance over a long period of time and the fees are really low, pile on. Well, that was a good idea at the beginning, at a time when you had a large universe of active investors committing capital, doing research, and making markets as buyers or sellers. But as the passive investing, and, and I understand this is not true in the UK. I think we're up to about 10% mosquito coverage. Right. right. Well, in the United States, we're up to about 70%. Okay. But passive investing really dominates. And I take your point about the UK. So now the problem is what happens when uh, there is a market downturn? Maybe it's not extreme, but 10 20%. Uh, the investors in these passive funds will call their brokers or hit their uh, keyboards and say, uh, get me out of it, so, you know, redeem my fund. Well, this forces passive investors to sell to get the cash to pay the redeeming investors, but you're selling into a declining market. What does that do? It drives the market down faster. Now, in the old days, not that long ago, by the way, the active investor would come along and say, ah, I see a bargain, I'm a buyer. But when the active investors disappear, these things go no bid. There's no one left to buy when everyone's selling or sell when everyone's buying or commit capital. There's no one left to do that job and the things go no bid and they just go straight down. So that kind of dynamic collapse could uh, be far worse than anything we've ever seen because with the, uh, with the diminution of active investors, there's no one left to commit capital. So, but that's gonna, this affects markets overall, right? Sure. This, this kind of volatility, it doesn't matter if you're in passive or in active funds, you're going to suffer from it, as you've described. Well, except but then that. Then why not join the party? Because if if we had more active funds, that decline would not be as extreme. There would be capital committers side by side with the free riders. So I, as a as a good person, should should stay in active to make sure that there's enough of that kind of critical mass to keep to keep it. I don't I don't suggest you should be a martyr to uh, the passive investing craze. What I suggest is that you should get out of stocks, at least to some extent. Go into other asset classes. And, you know, diversification, uh, well, first of all, diversification does work. Uh, it may be a cliche, but it, it actually does uh, help to preserve wealth. But people don't understand it. I run into people that say, well, I'm diversified. I own 50 different stocks in eight different sectors. So you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you're in one asset class called stocks, and they're highly correlated. Real diversification is have your slice of stocks, but have some gold, uh, have some private equity, 
have some cash, maybe more than most people think. And it sounds like a farm. That, that has as a well. farm, <laughs> well, has a farm uh, uh, as well. And that uh, is diversification. Okay. Jim, thank you so much for talking us through that. Thank, and thank you for joining. Thank you.